Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Well, another massive week. Apologies, this is coming to you a little bit later than normal. It is Father's Day here and I had a great day with my dad and Louis looked after me as well. So we do welcome a thousand new subscribers this week. Thanks for joining us on this journey, guys, as we do our best to navigate the turbulent financial markets as well as the world of crypto. And it certainly has been an eventful week. So plenty to get through there. I'm going to cover all the macro news first, but I do just want to remind you that if you've got friends and family that are new to crypto, we're continuing to add to these free resources. Every week you'll find new modules on here. So head over, have a search. If there's anything that's not there that you want, there's a uh, request form down the bottom as well. We also welcome 250 new members to our premium area this week. Uh, well over 3,500 now. It's just magnificent to have that community looking out for each other and all, I guess, sharing those news their favorite coins, um, yeah, helping each other out. So look, I did want to also mention that we've upgraded our five FA reports. So these have been extremely popular where we cover uh, five of the most interesting or innovative coins every month. But we're taking these a step further now and we're calling these the crypto spotlight reports because we want to put the spotlight on some older projects that are coming back uh, and really making some uh, noise. But not only that, we want to go more in depth. So a lot of the time we're doing a lot of research for this and we found that it wasn't always just being shared in the five FA report. So now we want to really bulk it out, you know, six or seven or more pages on each project that we put the spotlight on. So you get all those if you do become a member. Uh, we also want to remind you that we've got all our partners discounts on the website, but if you're a member, those uh, double discounts are actually in the group. And look, this promotion is still running, $100 free Bitcoin uh, for anyone that's planning on doing a bit of trading over on eToro. There's a link down below. But let's get into the local news. So Australia's GDP falls by most on record. Look, that's no surprise. We knew that this was coming. Some of the more granular numbers, though, put us not too bad a place. When you look at some of these other countries and how they've been hit, at these far larger numbers, you know, Australia's kind of near the top of this list so far. So holding up reasonably well. If you look at taxation revenue growth year on year, Obviously, every sector, you can't quite see this behind me, has uh, dropped. So very wide ranging in terms of where the government are going to get their tax money from. This is the huge problem that America's facing, but I guess all governments where more and more people kind of need these handouts at a time when they've got less money coming in. So this is the largest components of policy uh, stimulus in JobKeeper, and this is the uh, cliff, I guess people are calling it, where it looks like it's going to fall by around $100 billion next quarter. And that's where I think they're going to have to uh, increase those. Otherwise, you know, we're going to see people get evicted from their houses and no, nobody really wants that at the end of the day. So look, building approvals did bounce back in July. So this is pretty high month-on-month uh, -month figures here, which is fantastic to see. But we're also seeing uh, the developers and builders being warned uh, by the watchdog, the regulators, about these new powers coming to force and expect action. So basically what they're saying in a nutshell is, we're going to enforce those building standards to code, which should have been happening all along. But now after the you know, Opal and Mascot Towers uh, sagas, we don't want any more of those dramas. But I think there's a lot of things that are making people a little bit wary of investing in property. So look, with all this happening, the RBA have promised another $200 billion for the banks in terms of the funding facility. So barely any of that has actually been tapped for small businesses. Look, some has for the bigger end of town, but this is the story all over the globe where it's all good to print that money or to promise to give it to central banks and businesses, but someone has to take it. And if no one takes it, it just sits there at the banks in terms of, um, or in the form of reserves, I should say. So these stats that we're looking at here are all about the delinquency rates or how far behind certain sectors are with their bills. And the standard, I guess, 21 day grace period here, all the way out to 90 days in industries like transport, warehousing, administrative services, hires and rentals. So more and more people are getting behind. That obviously affects the cash flow of every business in that supply chain because people just don't have that cash flow to pay the bills. Australia's surplus did take a big hit again. Look, Martin and I will go into depth uh, in our monthly uh, Australian housing market and economy update this Friday, so I won't talk about that too much. One thing I did find funny this week well, was this meme about Australia's promised you know, gas-led recovery or oil and gas will pull us through. When you have a look at the tiny, tiny 
number here compared to all these other sectors that Australia should be focusing on or could be growing new sectors. I think it's just so funny that we're, I guess, somewhat the politicians as well as industry focused on some of these older things. In terms of freedom, Freedom Day protests in Australia. So look, I've been saying that Australia is going to experience civil unrest for a couple of years now because it always comes back to the financial roots and inequality and stems from there. So we did see the rallies this week. Uh, I think that our leaders haven't really been doing anything to calm this down. You know, the PM's questioning Victoria extending their lockdown. PM saying that, you know, Andrews' plan will add more to the economic pain. So a little bit of the blame game between the two parties. Not that I think anything would be a lot different, whoever was in power. And then stories like this hit the mainstream. Um, you know, pregnant Aussie mum posts something on Facebook and then the police come into their house and arrest her. I mean, the road that Australia has gone down in the past couple of years is just astonishing that more people aren't talking about it. Like this stuff is so extreme. Since when did it become okay to arrest someone for posting something on Facebook? You know, we've got all those encryption laws as well. Anyway, who knows where this is going? But a lot of people do believe that, you know, we need to stand up and defend our rights and freedom of speech. And they're the sort of things that are being now uh, encroached upon whether it's in the media or the police. So look, I hope we find a happy resolution here and our politicians wake up to it. Otherwise, you're going to see yellow vests and all the things we've seen across Europe and elsewhere in the world. There's nothing different in Australia if we want to start going down this road. Uh, Facebook also maybe have to prevent Australian users from sharing news because of these new (laughs) rules and laws Australia want to put in place. They believe that Australia is above math trying to ban encryption and now apparently is Australia is above everyone else um, in terms of not being able to share news and imagine if the big tech giants just say you know what that's too hard there's only 20 odd million users in Australia bad luck guys you can't use our app anymore and once again it's the Australian government just making this red tape when there's a thousand other things they should be concentrating on now I guess I'll also add with what's going on, I definitely think we need to be taking the conversation in a different direction with the stats that we have currently going on. So yes, I know that we still don't have all the data, but I said from the start that I'll be open to changing my mind once we get more data in. And the numbers, they are low enough to the point where we need to be starting having this plan. So I'm really looking forward to see what they say about the plan of coming out of lockdown. But I think that we've now... I guess, proven that if we put certain safety measures in place, we need to be opening up certain things a lot faster. And we might find that certain people are a lot less prone to it, but I still want to get that data and find out exactly how this virus works and what's happening. But I'm definitely leaning towards now that we're having these numbers so low, it's time to start moving the conversation forward about how we can uh, reopen. So... This article here about the Australian dollar spiking 30% since March, defying all the odds. So the reason I wanted to show you this was everyone talks about the US dollar dying. But if we think about the Australian dollar, and if you had said would the Aussie dollar spike 30% since the lows with jobless rates, you know, property bubble drifting lower, our stock market hasn't bounced back as hard as America, I think it's really obvious to people how much we're struggling. You know, Victoria is still in lockdown, our second largest state. No one would have said that the Australian dollar will be up 30% against, you know, the US dollar, world reserve currency, and some of these other currencies, but here we are. So when people say things like the US dollar is going to crash, you know, it's always relative to other things. And that is why Australian dollar has gone up because it's just relative to everywhere else. Like we saw in that GDP stat, we're not as bad, even though things are bad. So really important point to understand when we talk about anything really. It's always relative. Okay, so over to China here, we've got these huge challenges all in the banks. We've already seen the government had to privatize or bail out three or four banks. Bad debts, profits are cratering. Same old story as back in the financial crisis. So expect the government to step in there again. China to gradually sell off 20% of their treasury holdings. It may dump them all in case of a military conflict. So this isn't the a hot war. This is the cold war, the financial war that I keep talking about. It's going to be held in bonds and currencies and stock markets. So threatening to sell people's bonds is the new, I guess, threatening a, a hot war. Going after Tesla as well, Chinese electric vehicle startups being bailed out. 
you know, they don't want egg on their face. They don't want to be embarrassed. They want to compete with Tesla. So of course the government are going to bail out these motor companies in China. It's just this, this big game of chess. Over to Japan, where we did have um, the gentleman who invented that policy of money printing and buying bonds and ETFs, uh, Abenomics, as it's known. His uh, successor has taken over and all, talking all about uh, bolder strategies, easing uh, to battle these deflation risks. So once again, fighting deflation, just like Australia's facing, just like the US, been printing money and lowering interest rates for 20 or 30 years. But what's the strategy? We need to do more. You know, We need to be bolder. So look, nothing is going to change. And we've just seen this week Australia has gone down exactly the same path with $200 billion being the equivalent of, you know, a trillion, two trillion or more in the US if we look at per capita. So Australia is going down the exact same path in terms of what the central bank is going to do. All right, so Buffett paves the way for Japan. And a lot of the Japanese equities are undervalued compared to places elsewhere. And now the central bank is talking about printing money out of thin air. So guess what? All the wealthy are going to go park their money in the equity market while it raises and they are going to make the most of that. While the small guy, you know, it's kind of hard for them to invest in Japan or know where to move money. They can't do what Buffett can do. So once again, it's just the wealthy getting wealthier in a different place. And maybe some of the Bank of Japan's money flows to the US market still. So it's all just this turn of passing the baton about who's printing money and how the wealthy can make the most of that. India's economy shrank 24%. The developing nations that are getting hit the hardest uh, bipartisan bill over in the US looking to curb the US reliance on rare earths from China. So that is possibly good for Australia because we're a big exporter of those rare earth metals and we certainly need all the money we can get from exports at the moment. But once again, that trade war heating up between the two giants. We see exports uh, and imports to China both falling from the uh, US there. Um, that's so much for the phase one deal. and. Increasing, you know, agricultural purchases by 50 billion. Those things just aren't uh, realizing themselves at the moment. U.S. trade deficit has widened to the largest since the last financial crisis. Now, from those stats that we just saw, in terms of unemployment, we had nearly a million Americans file for the first time again last week. Total numbers ticked up to 29 million ongoing claims. So things are not getting better there. When we look at the rents, most expensive cities and how much that's fallen, so certain places here, San Francisco, uh, down 18%, 14% from a year ago. Uh, that's from June 2019, that 18% figure there. So look, even though rents are going down, people are moving out of the cities and it's no good if rent goes down 10% if you've lost your job and you've lost all your income. So that is the combination of factors that people are facing along with rising food prices. So this is just for the month. You know, eggs, 16%, cheese, uh, meats. These are the costs of goods, our everyday living expenses that are going up far more than that reported 2% inflation figure that they quote every year. Now, 30-year bonds did have a bit of a jump in uh, yields, expectations from the Fed, um, this is the same old stuff where, look, the reality is that we're facing negative interest rates and deflation, and they're actually still very much on the table, but the real inflation is widening, and that's where we see things like you know, bond yields going up because investors aren't going to park money in those bonds if they see everything around them going up hugely more than that in terms of inflation. That's where gold comes into the picture. So the Fed have already been really buy, uh, busy on a buying spree with those mortgage-backed securities. So a trillion dollars, hey, you know, another trillion dollars. No end in sight. They now own 30% of all outstanding uh, agency mortgage bonds. So they're planning to do more of that. It's commercial mortgage-backed securities, normal mortgage-backed securities. Uh, Australia are going to be doing the same thing in terms of stepping in to save our banks because we've got the most exposed bank books to the world in terms of uh, the mortgages that they have. Our central banks are buying $1 billion in assets every hour. So wouldn't that be nice if we had a money printer at our home to print a billion dollars every hour and go buy what we want? That is you know, the Swiss National Bank. Maybe they want to buy the dip and buy some more Apple stock or Tesla. I can't wait to the point where things get so overvalued that they've just got to look elsewhere and they start buying gold, silver equities, the mining stocks, maybe some physical as well. 
but eventually I think someone's gonna cave first. And whether it's just buying Bitcoin as a store of value, or maybe they say, hey, look, we love our tech stocks. Let's buy Ethereum as a bit of a tech play here. Maybe they buy just the grayscale large cap cryptos. But I think that free money that's going into everything, eventually someone is gonna be first and it's gonna make its way into the crypto markets. So the US economy needs more from the Fed, more stimulus in the coming months. We just keep hearing this every week. I think they're saving it for the last minute so Trump can come through as the hero for the election, as well as the Fed, I guess, to save the day. US corporate debt soars over $10 trillion now. now. That is a crazy amount of money that is going to have to be printed and bailed out. And I guess you know, privatize the profits. All these CEOs, remember, they're borrowing the money. They're paying themselves the bonuses and the huge salaries, but it's privatizing um, sorry, it's socializing and making the losses spread across all the public and the taxpayers. So nothing has been changed since the GFC. And that's why people are going to continue to get angry and hopefully protest and change things. All right, margin debt and free cash flow balances. We see that these peaks each time from the dot-com bubble, the GFC. Once again, we just have these huge spikes in margin debt. So People don't have that free cash flow coming through. They're leveraging up, borrowing on margin. And when things reverse, that's when you get that long squeeze, the opposite of a short squeeze. And where we saw that huge, huge decrease at the start of the year, um, that's where the central bank has no option because everyone is so levered up that everything would just collapse if they let the market fall more than 5 or 10%. And that is why you see... Headlines and panic when we even have a 5% pullback on some of these tech stocks these days. Here we see the difference between the 10-year bond and those inflation expectations like we just spoke about. So that gap continues to widen and that's what we call uh, real interest rates. And that is negative. That's why everyone is loving gold at the moment. Bridgewater Capital, this is Ray Dalio, legendary, legendary uh, hedge fund manager. They've got these quants in $400 billion trade and basically, uh, sorry, basics of what they're saying here is that no one wants to park their money in bonds anymore because A, there's no yield, but B, there's not really the growth there and the money that you're going to get paid in is not necessarily guaranteed if the Fed are going to have to keep printing trillions and trillions. So you're getting debased. They are looking elsewhere with a big, big sum of money that used to be going into those bonds. And this is where the US government, the Australian government, when they have to keep everyone on these benefits, they're not going to be able to fund it. And that's when people are going to start to talk about modern monetary theory. If we can print money to pay everyone, why do we need to pay taxes? You know, these are the conversations that are on the horizon. Investment grade bonds versus the S&P 500, we can see that the S&P has now got a better yield than some of these investment grade bonds. Uh, on the spread here. So that is making stocks more attractive at a time when things are risk and overpriced by traditional metrics, but people are just kind of ignoring that. And they're saying, well, if we can still get any sort of decent yield from the stocks and the Fed are going to print money, they've got our back. You know, we're basically just parking our money in there to get all these yields. Now, this is a chart of uh, weekly fund flows. So for the week of August here, last week of August, we did see more flowing into the fixed income assets, uh, relatively steady in equities there, getting long deflation. So that's the fear of deflation versus the fear of inflation that we just spoke about. Um, all while we have this, this, um, this buying happening there, we have the insiders continuing to offload. So this is the most that we've seen. This did break the November 2015 record. So over $6 billion offloaded by insiders from US listed companies. This is the same sort of uh, stat here, the ratio of insiders to uh, regular selling, and it's remained pretty elevated here around 25%. So this takes into account um, top 20 sales and buyers versus the last stat we looked at, which is just over billion dollar companies and just in the US. Here's the funds. Uh, the funds that are going in are continuing to go into the tech stocks. Mostly that is from retail traders though. So the big funds like we see here, two giant funds have suffered the biggest selling stampede on record. These are the, from the, you know, the ETFs, those style of funds. Um, massive, massive outflows here. So where is the money from that where is the money coming from that is going in to these stocks? And it's 
the crowd favorites once again. Look how crazy this chart is when people were saying that it was in a bubble back here, massive correction, spike up, another spike up, and then we sort of had a bit of fear in the last couple of days of last week. Uh, I think US stocks are closed on Monday. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but it really is insane the statistics that are holding up the market. So these are small traders buying those call options and the premiums that they've spent. So the small trader is betting that stocks are going to go up when they're at record highs. And a couple of years ago, 2017, what are they spending here? Maybe uh, $20 million, $20 billion, sorry. And now it's up over $500 billion in the last four weeks just from small retail traders. So that is where the money that is flowing in and speculating is coming from while insiders are selling. Here we can see the history of manias, uh, fang stocks, this is the increment, is it the percentage gain? Um, rebased at one, oh, so starting off at one. So the this is going from a one to a 20-fold return. So turning $1,000 into $20,000 and how long it would have taken in you know things like gold and Japanese banks and the NASDAQ bubble. Iron ore mania, that really helped Australia over that 10-year period there. So looking at stocks versus financial conditions, the spread is getting out to, I think, its widest ever point where financial conditions certainly don't warrant these prices. The fundamentals are out the window because of the Fed printing money. But something I've been reporting on for months now is that the big tech stocks are being dragged uh, in front of whether it's the Justice Department, Congress, you know, Australian lawmakers and policy makers there. So this is all coming. Apparently now this big antitrust suit against Google is only weeks away. So if you feel those big tech giants get you know, hammered really hard and have 20% pullbacks, that can really bring down the whole indexes and the wider ETFs because they're now making up, you know, 20, 25% of those, just the five stocks. And the, behind all of that, we've also got the election coming up. And what the volatility futures index is now pricing in is the, the worst volatility or the most expected volatility around a, an election of all time. And remember how crazy the Trump election was? I was trading at the time and everything tanked and people thought it would be a crash if Trump got elected. But what actually happened was people were just selling out to reposition themselves in the things that Trump was bullish on. So money went out of a lot of stocks and into gold, but then it went back into different stocks and gold you know, came back down. So people are going to reshuffle here a lot depending on what's going to happen. And the problem is they don't know how to reshuffle because it's such a tight two-horse race at the moment. And Trump's really come back. So this is the um, the prediction market on FTX. And Trump started off you know, around 65% here, and he's just gone lower and lower. I actually believe this is far more accurate than the polls you're going to see in the, you know, the biased different medias. Um, but it's bounced back from where he got down to 40%, and Biden was the favorite backup over... Uh, about 44% at the moment. So look, he's made a little bit of a comeback. This is the sort of put your money where your mouth is theory that these investors uh, should be more accurate in predicting than just a random, I guess, newspaper poll or television poll. But either way, with all that uh, uncertainty, it's still just another catalyst for gold. Those ETF flows continue to creep higher, which we absolutely love, that real demand for real gold. Venezuela turning to gold mining as well to escape that uh, economic ruin. I've tried everything, you know, backing their, their crypto with oil. Now they're going to try and mine more gold, which I, I do think that these are the sort of countries that are just as likely to say, you know what, let's print some money out of thin air and buy some Bitcoin to add to our reserves before anyone else does. Uh, but despite all those fundamentals, yes, we do know that gold is extremely overstretched when we look at things like you know the Bollinger Bands and different moving averages and RSIs. So guys, look, we welcome the correction from this bottom here. What was it around 1,200 up to over 2,000, nearly doubling in two years. Hey, we don't mind a little bit of a pullback, and a lot of people missed out on this run, and they're dying to get in and, and buy in for the first time on any pullback. Now, at the same time, I think a lot of these uh, warehouses that are short on physical silver, they need to actually buy the metal on this pullback as well. So I think that's all going to support um, the price. I don't think we're going to have too deep of a correction as long as the fundamentals and the macro backdrop stays where it is. So these are some really interesting stats. Um, have a read about some of the shadow contracts and you know the paper to 
real leverage, whether it's 100 to 1 or 500 to 1 that some people have uh, speculated at. But um, yeah, there's some, some tinfoil theories. But oh, as always, I actually think the truth lies somewhere in the middle, and they are certainly playing games and running low on physical metal. Here we see the best performing assets uh, in August as well as year to date, and silver topped that list. So um, silver's now up 60% year to date. You guys know that I've been very bullish on silver the whole time. We're looking at the gold to silver ratio. Uh, we've been talking about the shares. So look, we try and do um, education, fundamental based research on the different, um, I guess, techniques on how to look at the companies and what they've got in ground those sort of things, and then you can take that information, go away, do your own research, and come to those conclusions. And we've also got Marika Tusa, his special reports. If you're right into it and you wanna actually get to the individual stock picking, um, he's got those reports. There's a big discount for you guys down below as well. But uh, look on the chart, silver still looks beautiful here, forming a perfect pennant so far, uh, as well as gold, very, very similar price action. and. People just aren't selling. That's what we love to see. A big run up, a very, very few sellers. And it's those day traders that take a few profits, let the momentum indicators catch back up, and then, hey, let's go off to the races again. Uh, just a reminder that if you do want to get exposure, you know, the, the gold and silver ETFs, uh, the gold miners indexes, those type of things, the very popular products, uh, no fee trading on eToro. And that $100 bonus is still running. Uh, link down below for that. Okay, let's get into the crypto news. So I did mention it before at the start of the episode. I did just want to re-mention it again for those of you that are interested in our fundamental analysis and deep dive reports. Um, the new Spotlight report is the way that we're going to be doing them now. So they are available uh, free for our members. And guys, uh, cost of membership will be going up in future. Um, but not if you join now. So if you join before we launch the new uh, platform, we will honor all the legacy members with that legacy pricing. Okay, so US Federal Court calls uh, NSA's mass phone surveillance collection illegal. So this is what Edward Snowden was talking about all those years ago, and this is a really important ruling. For once the people actually win, the small guy over this wiretapping or whatever you want to call it. So look, I had a boss uh, going off on a tangent 10, 15 years ago who told me about all this and it was a full-on tinfoil hat conspiracy at the time and it's come out and be proven to be fact every single aspect of it. And that's why we have to keep an open mind, um, read both sides of every equation and look for that evidence. So well done. That's a, a good win for the little guy there. A bit sonar whistleblower. So this is one that I called out on Twitter. A lot of the mainstream YouTubers were promoting this at the time. Uh, even some of like literally the top two or three YouTubers. And I tried to reach out to them and they basically told me where to go. But um, look, someone tried to fake his own murder. It's good that all these guys are now getting caught and it's going to catch up with them. The you know Even in Australia, the policymakers have got the details of everyone that was promoting, you know, USI Tech, BitConnect, all those scams. And I've helped um, help them understand how it all works and what's going on. Alpha Bay Darknet uh, market moderator sentenced to 11 years in jail. We did have uh, this week the uh, Empire. So the other large dark market went down after a few years. Um, we also had Bitthumb have their headquarters raided in Korea. I think this was a little bit uh, melodramatic, some of these titles we're hearing. There's some wash trading happening in some Korean exchanges. Look, some worse than others, but I really think that um, nothing really is going to change. People can go back to work at Bitthumb. People are going to keep on trading. And some of these um, raids in different countries get, I guess, maybe taken out of context a little bit. As I said before, uh, BitConnect promoter, uh, banned by ASIC for seven years. Uh, look, I would have gone a lot harder than that. And this story says that policymakers or regulators thought that he might have made a uh, hundred grand. I mean, anyone in crypto knows that there were retail level mum and dad investors that were making millions of dollars from signing others up. So if he was the head guy in Australia, um, he's made out with millions. So look, I hope that that didn't go unnoticed by regulators there. The, I guess government, whether it's Blockchain Australia, you guys know I used to be a board member there for a couple of years. Uh, 
policymakers are really getting behind blockchain in Australia. So look, talking about combating all the problems we have with authenticity of Australian foods and wines, just as uh, look, China may be having less demand for those. But anyway, we've got a big iron ore company, Vale. I think they're a subsidiary of BHP. This is the transaction I spoke about last week. So uh, moving t- hundreds of thousands of tons of iron ore Malaysia, China, get it all in the blockchain, all those shipping documents, electronic, it's on that ledger. You know, there's nothing to worry about or go missing. It can all be trustless and, uh, you know, validated there. Australian Senate, blockchain will create 3 trillion of value in 2030. Well, if it's going to create 3 trillion of value, I hope we actually get behind it and continue to make clearer policy guidelines so that we do have jobs. But I'll tell you right now, it's not going to create 3 trillion of value while we've got these encryption laws in Australia and we're not allowed to post on Facebook. What is it going to be next? You know, Google and then no YouTube. We're really just stifling our future if we're doing some of the things that we're currently doing. A Revolut did come to Australia finally. So this is a great payments app. You can send all different currencies across the world. And now they've actually added crypto for Aussie users as well. So if you haven't used Revolut, definitely give it a try. Instead of paying high bank fees, you can use this app. Uh, and obviously, once they add crypto, that is the next step further. Even again, you know, cutting out more fees and whatnot. Not there. U.S. banking regulators. So, uh, sorry, U.S. regulator to shake up uh, banking with federal charter for uh, payment firms. This is just another example of these banks experimenting with the different ledgers and um, payment solutions. Three of Australia's big four banks are looking to bring bank guarantees to the blockchain. We've got uh, Tezos finally settling this uh, settlement with investors. So this was a $230 million ICO. This dragged on for three years and finally they've paid $25 million and settled it. So good news uh, for Tezos holders that had that hanging over their head for a while. We've got MIT and helping the Boston Fed looking to create their central bank digital currency. They want to scale that for consumer use. So we know that digital Fed coin is coming in some way, shape or form. Changing years here though, gaming tokens. Uh, F1 Delta launching their Rev token on Uniswap this week. So this is all about uh, Aminoka brands. I'm all into the motorsports there. Not really my thing, but I think the number of angles and utilities of these gaming and nft tokens is going to bring in all sorts of interests and people that haven't had any exposure to crypto yet muse so those of you out there that are muse fans helping uh, launch their own set of nft collectibles crypto kitty style campaign there final bit of gaming news i had for you was Ultra integrating with Theta for live streaming. I know we've got plenty of fans of Theta in the audience. So that is one that I do hope gets good traction, but it is really all about the partnerships and getting the users, getting the network effects um, for all the streaming and gaming that they want to do. Uh, Sand was another one that's launched re- recently. So gaming tokens are the, the flavor of the month at the moment. I am really bullish on that sector. But Coinbase have announced that they are getting into these crypto startup launches. So basically IEOs and raising of cash. So I expect them to also get into the gaming space. But look, I did a write-up, uh, I think it was a couple of days ago for members, all about my theory on what's going on here is the, the giants, FTX, Binance, Coinbase, they're now really competing for the IEOs, which Binance used to do and now FTX got into, now Coinbase getting into there. You know, we see Binance launching their their chains and FTX have got their plays on DEXs and decentralized options. Uh, More news we'll get to there in a second, but now it's really Coinbase and they've been big supporters of Ethereum all along. So I don't see them launching their own DEXs and whatnot. I see them integrating and that is going to be an interesting experiment to see who wins. If Coinbase help Ethereum adoption, maybe Kraken and others get on board that as well, or we see these other chains and these exchanges can actually capture community because that is what determines the winner at the end of the day. So as I just mentioned, Binance have launched their smart contract enabled blockchain. They've added staking and that's a big, big bullish driver for BNB, which I spoke about months ago for members. Uh, Binance have also launched liquidity swap. So look, DEXs have been dominating and now surpassed some of these other exchanges in volume. And what are these other exchanges meant to do? They're sort of sitting on their hands and that's why 
that attack on IO's DEX's DeFi that I just mentioned is coming from all the big giants. They have to make some sort of play there. Uh, really interesting that Binance uh, are going this route as well. Uh, Wazir X, the Indian exchange, has also launched staking. They're getting into DeFi. I think I spoke about the partnership with, um, was it Matic last week? Adding staking for a range of coins there. And look, everyone loves it, loves their rewards and loves their staking coins. But I do hope it doesn't become too centralized with everyone just doing it on exchanges. That kind of defeats the purpose. BitMEX have rolled out their mobile app, now trading in 140 countries. They also announced that they're going to be adding more coins. Once again, the competitive landscape. They've lost volume. They're making less money. They've got to add the alts, and this is all going to add to this, this alt season and these cycles that continue. This is the parabolic chart. You know, a billion dollars in June to this huge, I think we passed 10 billion already. So, you know, a few days and stories are out of date in this space at the moment. Total value locked in DeFi. Um, look, we've seen everything from scams to brilliant projects to these satire memes actually turning into million dollar projects themselves. So Vitalik Buterin did come out and talk about how this is just printing tokens out of thin air and it is like the Fed printing money and I do agree with that. Um, you know, 99% of all projects are going to fail but we continue to see people chase the next big hot thing and that's where a lot of these copycats are going to get in trouble. So Swerve was actually a fork of Curve because they weren't happy with Curve doing an unfair launch. And then sure enough, a few minutes early, they had the same issue that we saw the other day and that, you know, that Curve did. So this is just nuts sort of stuff that this keeps happening. Whether or not it was an honest mistake, let's wait and see what happens when the dust settles. But people keep tripping up trying to do the right thing. And that is where this competition for someone actually come in and, and legitimately do it well. It's a reason that Yearn Finance has dominated because they have been such, uh, I guess, community first team. Now, SushiSwap has been you know, absolutely the talk of the town this week, but particularly today. So they announced that they're going to be giving out this token and drawing liquidity from Uniswap because Uniswap was backed by VCs, venture capitalists. They wanted to have a community-owned version of Uniswap. And we already had hundreds of millions of dollars committed to move over and they actually moved the schedule forward. They're ready to go this weekend. Now, Cointelegraph actually wrote an article saying, you know, how can these DeFi projects avoid just getting cloned? Because it's going to continue to happen. And this is known as a vampire attack where you drain the liquidity out of these other projects. You offer tokens to people as an incentive to come. And whoever's going to be the winner is the one that has, you know, the lowest fees, but is giving the community the most rewards of those fees. And you take all the profits if you hold the token. Now, that's far better than all the profits going to venture capitalists in the mind of, I guess, the pure uh, cypherpunks that want everything to be fully decentralized. But everything has to start somewhere. Someone has to start the project. And it was an anonymous dev, uh, Chef Nomi, and he all of a sudden chose to disappear and sell his tokens. And $27 million of these funds could disappear at the drop of a hat was the headline. So Cointelegraph actually called this a few days ago. I also did a big write-up as I said a couple of days ago for members saying, I think there's something going on here because um, FTX kind of got behind this very early on um, and I think they would love to integrate with this sort of project. And then today, it was this huge controversy when the dev sold all his tokens and people initially thought he was exit scamming or whatever. And he said, no, I'm just selling. I want to be like Charlie Lee who sold all his tokens. But look, I don't know if I believe him and the community certainly weren't very happy that he's dumped all these tokens and got, I think it was $17 million of ETH. But he said, look, I still plan on working and doing the migration. But by the end of the day, crypto Twitter had just been raging for hours. And uh, they came out and said, look, we're going to continue our, our mission and we want to build this community-owned version of Uniswap. And that's why I like the project. And I really think it did have good fundamentals. That idea of the community owning Uniswap and getting the fees it's the exact reason why Yearn Finance has been so successful. But I did, uh, I actually let members know during the week that I was buying this one. I also let them know that I was selling this one because things got crazy. It went into a bubble. You know, Binance listed it. And I started to see those other, I guess, uh, maybe little cracks appearing. 
Anyway, after all that happened, finally, Sam comes out and says, look guys, I am happy to take over this project. And the community wanted someone to take over from Chef Nomi and bring this project forward. So the price bounced really sharply. The Everyone is, uh, I'm not surprised that the hashtag um, sushi's back on the menu is probably trending on Twitter by the time I'm doing this video because everyone thought sushi was dead and now it's back alive. Um, Sam from SBF that's been, uh, from FTX that's been an absolute innovator and they've been killing it lately. You've now got the hottest project and uh, best individual who's driving all of this in charge of this project. So people now got bullish on this again. I'm probably going to wait to see what happens when the dust settles. But if they do this migration successfully, they take all that volume over, then I think it's automatically going to be that competitor that people are going to see. Uh, look why I like that project. But anyway, let's see what happens there. Look, moving on, despite the sell-off and all the panic over this weekend, the fundamentals of Ethereum and DeFi still remain strong. This is uh, statistics from the graph, which is a querying protocol, and we see how many queries. So this is the real-world use of all the different protocols, just going absolutely parabolic there. Obviously, we want all that data to be as accurate and integral as it possibly can be. So oracles have become very important. Band Protocol have their CEO has come out and said that a single data request costs four hundred fifty dollars. So I'm sure that there's going to be an explanation for this uh, from the Chainlink community. That um, I'll I'll read your comments down below. If someone wants to let me know because there's no doubt that Chainlink are still an absolute powerhouse. They are the leader. Best projects out there like Synthetics are now using and relying on Chainlink for all their DeFi exchange data. But there are competitors out there. So Looprings also tapped Chainlink, uh, sorry, tapped a Chainlink competitor. So they've actually chosen Band. And I think that's maybe why you see these sort of stories saying, hey, you know, this one's expensive. And then it's no surprise that they're trying to get these other projects in. So this is the, I guess, um, not concern, but the issue or what I wanted to always know about Chainlink was how does that token continue to compete with everyone else once these exchanges have their own oracles and other protocols? Can they outcompete? Can they be a cheaper alternative? So that's what I am waiting to see now. But for the time being, like I said, Chainlink continue to innovate. They're now getting data on uh, Rootstock, which is Bitcoin's smart contract sidechain layer. I've spoken about this the other week with uh, Bitcoin Benny when we we're talking about Red Fox Labs and how they're doing a similar thing. So they've currently got their NFT tokens on Wax, but they they have partnered up to do this on Rootstock. So to have NFTs on Bitcoin, which will be a first. Uh, I think they also want to obviously do it on Ethereum because that's where all the liquidity is. And then once you have a bridge and you can plug into anywhere, Chainlink can now give you the data for anywhere. That's when these big, big protocols become interoperable uh, along with the polka dots and cosmoses of the world. And that's when things get really, really exciting once they can all talk to each other and transfer value. Uh, Real T have tokenized uh, real estate officially. That has all come to Aave, the lending protocol. So you can now tokenize your house and put it as collateral. Don't trade on 100X if you've got your house as collateral. All right, so uh, UMA overtook Yearn Finance as the largest DeFi protocol briefly. So uh, UMA or UMA, as some people call it, is a exchange protocol where you can basically make your own trading pairs and synthetic assets. So very exciting stuff there. Maker has finally had its peg restored thanks to Yearn Finance. So during the week, I did a, a big write-up about how I was... I'd bought the dip on, on Yearn Finance, the Wi-Fi token. Some people think I'm crazy for buying a coin for $25,000. But anyway, that the fact that they put the ETH into the vault and then they use the DAI that you get as collateral, they use that as well. And that creates demand for DAI and it's being able to restore the peg, which DAI hadn't quite been able to get to there as well because of the mechanics of the interest rates that are available at the moment. So look, it's... Not only great when you see the DeFi Legos all working together, but when they actually mutually benefit each other, um, that's what I'm excited about. And being able to get huge yields on your ETH is far better than just hodling ETH. Once we know it's all safe and maybe you want to insure it with Nexus Mutual to ensure it's safe, I think that this is going to just be another big catalyst and driver uh, for Ethereum as we head towards staking as well. 
So this story is uh, a couple of days old now, but already 140 million was in that vault. I think we're over 500 or 600 million already. So look, a lot of ETH is heading towards that vault, um, that Yearn Finance vault. All right, quick drink, then back into it. So Ethereum miners are making $800,000 per hour there. Everyone is paying a lot in gas fees at the moment, and they're quite happy campers because they get the block reward and the gas fees. Now, when we implement uh, EIP-1559, that's going to burn all those gas fees. So $800,000 of ETH per hour would be going to the uh, graveyard address and out of circulation, making ETH more scarce. The devs have all put their head together. They're continuing to look for ways to optimize gas. And this actually led to an interesting story about George Soros. And he was saying that, in theory, you could try and buy up all the gas tokens that are out there trading now so that gas would become even more expensive um, and basically try and break Ethereum. So, look, game theory says it's possible. Let's see if that happens. If the maximalists were to do that, maybe Ethereum tax Bitcoin back. Look, I'm not sure, but I think that it's just going to facilitate that need and the urgency for these scaling solutions, which we know are coming, but all the other projects need to implement them. MetaMask has finally launched a desktop um, mobile version of their wallet. Uh, escapes the desktop, sorry, and that is going to bring in a whole influx of users. So. Look, the bottleneck at the moment is the, the gas fees and the, the throughput that we can have. So it's all well and good to have that mobile wallet, but we actually probably can't handle hundreds of millions of users on mobile at the moment. Optimistic rollups is the most promising. Um, I did a big, big thread on Twitter during the week. Uh, check that out if you haven't already, but talking about the different scaling solutions. This one is probably the, the big game changer and it's uh, three months or so away. Uh, for some projects, you know, six to 12 months before, I guess, all the projects that want to use it have rolled it out. But we've got others coming. So this is uh, Cairo that was announced by Starkware. Some of these types of scaling solutions are already helping projects like Gods Unchained, and they've proven to be able to do, you know, thousands of transactions per second. So look, plenty of good stuff on the way. $500 million in tokenized Bitcoin is making its way into the world of DeFi. We also saw FTX actually add a one-click wrapping feature. So if you're not good with DeFi and all those wallets, you can actually just uh, tokenize your Bitcoin with one click on FTX exchange now as well. The Lightning Network has had its uh, value continue to creep up after it did fall uh, quite a bit throughout 2019. It's kind of been chopping around, but I am glad to see that that total value locked in Lightning is growing. And uh, yeah, let's hope it breaks the all-time high because it did stall a little bit there. And look, we need Bitcoin to scale as well as Ethereum. Let's not forget that. Kazakhstan on track for 700 million mining investment goals. So this is that geopolitical battle for hash rate that I've been talking about. We've got big commitments from all the uh, US miners, oil and gas companies. These guys are actually now getting paid to produce Bitcoins. Um, even though they're probably going to have all this flaring of the gas or whatever it was that was just going to go to waste hey now they get to mine bitcoin maybe they hodl that bitcoin let's hope so in terms of hash rate i just wanted to mention this because these coins continue to struggle etc has been attacked so many times lately i'm not sure how anyone can still trust it uh, but ihk's had that proposal for using the bitcoin blockchain to prevent 51 percent attacks um Maybe Caldano, that's the other option that they obviously thrown up with their interests. But we're going to see a lot of companies as well as blockchains piggyback off Bitcoin security. And that's a value proposition that doesn't get spoken about uh, all that often. Last couple of bits of news here. We had a press release uh, from the CFTC. Ledger X, who do the crypto derivatives, have now been approved to do all sorts of um, fully collateralized futures and options as well. So if you're a trader there, you might be able to trade some commodities and other things all of a sudden. But this is actually you know, a little bit taboo, these headlines as always, but very, very big news because we know these are multi, multi-billion dollar industries and now they're accepting these kind of currencies. We know that a lot of the... Um, businesses in this industry have been debanked and so now that they can use crypto again it's just going to bring in more and more users um, it's it's a good thing and uh look a couple of cheeky tweets to and from charlie lee during the week if you want to check out his twitter as well 
From Sentiment here, we've got a bit of data about the exchange flow. So we did have a lot of ETH being sold off, and that certainly was one of the uh, contributors to the top here. So top 100 exchange wallets uh, held, and they did shed a lot of Ethereum. That was in, I guess, contrast to a few of um, the other projects as well. So you always want to be looking at what projects are sort of increasing their hodlers. Uh, but this stat was something that I did mention, the miners and the outflows there. And some people were sort of worried about how many Bitcoins were going to exchanges. And I was actually in the boat of thinking that it was a lot of it from the, uh, the Bitcoins that are heading to DeFi and getting wrapped because we've seen $500 million worth. Um, but obviously, in hindsight now, that was probably another contributing factor that did lead to that sell-off because... Uh, Miners have got those bills to pay like we spoke about in our monthly crypto mining update. Uh, but this was a, a good chart, again, probably presenting the other argument that a lot of the Bitcoins that have been sold recently are from people that bought at higher prices. So the bigger dots represent bigger volume. So a lot of, I guess, noobs that sort of FOMO'd in here um, buying these tops each time they are actually the ones that have sold because we can get that data on chain. So really cool stuff this time from uh, Whale Map. In terms of price action, so guys, I did throw this up last week for our members as I, the, I guess the outlook that I had in terms of if the market doesn't get what they want from power, this head and shoulders pattern. And I certainly didn't think we we're going to get down to 9,800 uh, this quickly within a few days, but it is funny how these things play out. The you know what seemed almost impossible has happened perfectly, almost to the dollar. Now we've hit this uh, nine thousand eight hundred level. Not only that, we've come back and tagged the middle of the Bollinger Bands or the twenty uh, period moving average on the weekly time frame. And as you see here, throughout two thousand and fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. That happened regularly throughout the bull market. So I guess I just wanted to share that one to let you know that it's perfectly normal what we've seen. Now, it's been a crazy, crazy sell-off uh, these last few hours. But finally, here on the hourly chart, we've got a bit of a, a bullish divergence with price drifting lower and RSI a little bit hidden here, but it is um, drifting up. So look, the bottom there was 9,800 Oh, well, I hope it's the bottom um, on Bitcoin. And if we have a look here, we got down to around uh, $310 on Ethereum. So look, everyone was begging for a pullback. It's funny how we come and touch these levels here, the weekly support, keep it nice and simple. And we've touched that perfectly. Maybe that's it, guys. It was brutal. I honestly did not think we would be getting down this far in Ethereum. You know, 40% pullback from nearly $500. People have been hoping to get in. Uh, happy happy days if you got an entry here. So look, I think even if stocks open down on Monday and it's a bloodbath, we probably still have a bounce just because of how oversold we are on so many different timeframes here, whether we're looking at you know the RSI, um, our Bollinger Bands, Whenever we go down this far, we tend to sort of mean revert, which is what I've been talking about uh, with members. So look, that's what I've got my eyes on. Uh, I've also been speaking about the ETH Bitcoin uh, ratio and how I thought that was getting a little bit toppy. And if this has a pullback, it probably means that alts are going to pull back. Um, look, I've been really clear that I thought that DeFi was in a bubble and we're due for this as well. Take some profits, have some stable coins on the sideline to buy your favorites. Look, I hope that uh, has been an enjoyable update for you guys. Head over to nuggetsnews.com.au. Um, share this video around, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll talk to you again soon. Cheers.